No, well, I appreciate you being here, Ram, and, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and I'm delighted uh, that you've made it to Australia. And I guess, you know, my first question is, um, you know, what brings you to Australia? Because I understand you're based in uh, everyone's favourite area, Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that now that the effects of the pandemic are, are, are finally subsiding, it's nice to be able to to go out and talk to customers and, and folks in 3D. I think I'm enjoying the interactions with our customers here. You know, Cloudera, we are fortunate that we have a number of customers in the area, in the telco space, financial services, and the government as well. And so this is an opportunity for us to engage deeply on their data strategy to kind of map out both where they are and from a digital transformation standpoint, but also where they want to go with their data. So that's the that's the uh, the goal for, for these conversations with the customers. Right. Okay. Excellent. So meeting customers. No, wonderful. The relatable Cloudera customer is that we know in our area. Absolutely. I think we can talk about a few uh, specifically and then a couple more more generally. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Deakin University is a good one to touch oh, upon. Yes. Right. So these folks, they're, they're local and you know that higher education is, is sort of, this is an important topic of conversation here, right? To your point of relatability, we all have to think about it. Uh, I think that having a, a they have adopted Cloudera's technology to provide a very data-driven, data-centric education experience, right? So this is more focused around learning outcomes and personalized education for, for, their, for their student base, right? So this is a pattern that we actually see across the customer base that data used to be, you know, the thing that powers reports. And instead now, if you think of, you know, the entire end-to-end -end experience is something that, Data is every part of that of that digital exhaust that's being generated for as part of you know interacting with their students, with their with their customers, and so on. And they want to be able to provide uh, the capabilities that can take advantage of this all of this data in a way that that enriches the experience for the customer. So they're one. Um, another is actually the uh, the Australian Defence Forces. Right. You know they are they are in the process of rolling out uh, an e health system. This is again around personalized medicine. It's yeah, the, the, yeah, the ADF has an, has an e-health system that they are rolling out, and that also happens to be on top of the, the Cloudera data platform, right? And this, the goal of this system is to, is to provide, you know, uh, personalized medicine for the service folks, right? And this is, this is a, that entire experience is actually managed by on top of this platform. That's another example. Uh, generally speaking, I would say, you know, uh, the telco space is very important for us, especially with the rollout of 5G. So we're meeting with a number of the uh, of the customers in the telco space, uh, where we see that the expansion of 5G is going to result in a tremendous amount of volume of data that's uh -huh. coming from the from the new capacity and the new uh, the enhanced performance of 5G as compared to the previous generations of the technology. Fantastic! No, that's really interesting. I appreciate that, and it's always good to get that local flavor. I guess talk Absolutely. about data, you know, and I guess when you spoke about Deakin University, you talk about how, you know, data used to be that thing, the powers report, but now it's this entire end-to-end -end experience. And I think, um, you know, there's been this saying in the last few years that data's a new gold or data's a new oil. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, you know, I heard, and, and that sounds great when you hear that, you think, yeah, data's valuable. But then I heard yeah. somebody say, actually, data isn't the new gold or the new oil because what makes those things precious is their scarcity. But that is not scarce. It's everywhere. You know, the problem we have is interesting. Yeah, is 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 raining in and managing that data. So I guess you know, I'm interested in your view. What, what I guess, how would you categorize? Yeah, it? that's funny. I I like particularly that data is a new oil metaphor, because I feel like you know, data is the fuel, right? Just like oil, it's fuel that that powers you know new ways of doing business for a lot of companies, and there's a lot of value to be had there. But just like oil bad things happen if there is a leak or a spill no, no, or a true. breach, right? And so I think that there is, there is this duality to data in that you have to be careful about how you manage and process and handle it. And then you get to monetize it and get an extensive amount of, you know, not just monetary value, but also like new customer experiences that you could not think about even five years ago. Right? So I think data is that enabler that can do both of those things, right? Yeah, I love that. That's actually, you know, when you talk about, yeah, you don't want to have a spill. Gosh, you're right. <laughs> you don't want that to spill. <laughs> yeah. So, 
But, um, you know, I suppose what are some of the challenges then that you're seeing with companies that in managing all this? I mean, you talk about 5G and the exciting thing about having all this data and you spoke about digital exhaust. How do we manage this? I mean, is data too much now for companies to deal with? And I think that, you know, what's recently uh, a lot of complexity for our customers comes from the fact that data is everywhere, to your point. Right. It used to be data was in these nice transactional systems that you talk to once a day and you got a batch report out of. And now you have you know, real-time data, streaming data, social media data, you know, data that's born in the cloud, you know, data that's provided by SaaS services as they operate, data that, that's still a catalog feed that you might get from outside your company, from, from another third party of some kind. Right. So there's so much data and so many kinds of data floating about. I think that being able to handle all of this data consistently is, is one of the challenges that our customers are wrestling with. Right? This is where, you know, regardless of whether the data is on premise in your data center or whether it's in a public cloud, being able to treat that data from a, from a security standpoint in a way where you set your policies once and they apply everywhere, techniques like that are really important for customers when they think about data management. It's just the variety and volume of data is, is requiring them to think about data management much more holistically and much more consistently than they used to. So you might've seen the phrase data fabric. The, the whole point of the fabric is to say, let's make data management consistent regardless of where the data is underneath of the fabric. Wow. I like that. I, you know, I have heard the term data fabric and I never really had a succinct explanation. So I like that. So. Actually, if we're, I guess, getting specific then to cloud era, so we've talked about, uh, you know, clients, the data explosion, the challenges are facing. But I, you know, I understand from cloud era, um, and this is probably from a marketing blurb, but, you know, the product allows for a depth of data processing beyond simply data accumulation and storage. So I suppose what I'm keen to understand is, you know, what does this mean in a practical sense? So how does cloud era help people rein in that data and leverage it and, I guess, indeed, is that data fabric a part of that? Yeah. So I think when it comes to data management, that is sort of Cloudera's, you know, uh, one of the things that we have done very effectively, I would say, is implement a data fabric that's very hybrid, right? So whether the data is on-premise or in public cloud, it gives us a very consistent way to manage, lets customers manage the data in a consistent way. The other mega trend is actually putting data in the hands of people who really need it. To make decisions, right? You know, five or six years ago, it would be that people in IT would interact with a platform like Cloudera. So you would have a couple hundred people, even in a large organization, who would interact with us. Today, as businesses become more and more data driven, so to speak, everybody in the business needs access to the data, right? So now you have thousands of people who, as part of their daily jobs, they need to be able to store, manage, and process data. So what this means is, we can't go and retrain all of these people. We have, we have to meet them where they are, right? So it's it's supporting a wide variety of tools. SQL is still a very popular way for people to access data, but it's also increasingly machine learning. It's, it's notebooks. It's the tools that they're already comfortable with. So self-service data analytics is a nice foil to consistently managing data. You know, if you have a consistent data management experience, that's great, but you have to put it in the hands of these practitioners for you to actually make decisions with the data. So that's the other thing that Cloudera enables is it enables all of these practitioners in these companies to get access to the data that they need using the tools that they already know how to use. That's the second aspect of what we do. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, so actually I was interested, I mean, following on from that, where you talk about Cloudera and what it can do, I was interested in your LinkedIn profile where you mentioned, uh, I guess, like what you were saying then, you know, years ago, uh, data was part of the IT team and so on, but now you're excited by the possibility of disruptive techniques like a lake house, a data fabric, the data mesh. I guess, can you help me understand also the lake house? So this is something that definitely, um, you know, the term that I'm hearing more and more, obviously, uh, yeah. you know, we, people know what a data warehouse is and the data lake, even the data swarm, but the data lake house, what, I guess this is definitely something I'm seeing emerging. What, yeah. what can you help me understand what that means? Yeah, it's it's actually it's it's a simple context, you know, concept that follows on from self-service analytics that I talked about, right? If you want to really have large numbers of people be able to analyze the data that you have in your company, 
you want to be able to have your cake and eat it too, right? So you need the, you, you, you need to be able to store vast amounts of data, which is the lake, but a warehouse is, is sort of a, a predictable way to analyze that data using SQL, right? So imagine, you know, you, you could have, when I talk about unstructured data, I'm talking about, it could be video recordings, it could be images, it could be audio recordings, things of that nature, but you still want to be able to very quickly and efficiently find a clip that you're looking for, right? You you know, in all of this unstructured data. So I think that this lake house pattern, the simplest way to think about this is that it, it takes unstructured data and it exposes in a structured way through a wide variety of tools. So it's both a lake and a warehouse at the same time, hence the, hence the lake house, okay? But it's about bringing, you know, putting data in the hands of large numbers of people using the tools that they already have. That's the business value of implementing a lake house. Right, no, that's fantastic. You know, um, I guess we talk about making data available to everybody and you've spoken, you know, with passion about how we put in the hands of the people who need it using the tools they need it. But I suppose do we have a risk that we expose data to the wrong people? I mean, how can we, what, I guess, what can we do to ensure that we make it easy for those who need to use it, but at the same time uh, ensure that we're tracking, we've got security, we've got compliance, we're protecting the CII, all these all these things that unfortunately you know ruin our utopia of making data. I think this is a very topical subject these days, right? Is you know being able to have the right use of data, making sure that data is protected and it's 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 accessible to the people that it's only supposed to be. I think this is where uh, you know platforms like Cloudera are, are. We can make a big difference in how customers can implement a secure data management policy, right? And typically. You know, just like cyber, I think that uh, protecting data access is, it's, you know, it has to be defense in depth, right? If there's multiple, think of it as, you know, you have one set of controls as to who can access what data, and then you have another set of, set of controls around encryption. You have another set of controls underneath of that to, to your point, if it's PII, if it's a credit card number or a national ID or something like that, to, to mask sensitive data further, right? So there has to be defense in depth. You have to use a variety of different techniques so that, you know, it's almost like you have both belts and suspenders so that you're never caught without your pants, right? So that's, <laughs> that's I, I view data privacy uh, and, and data security as something that you have to think about it in a similar, you know, defense in depth kind of, uh, kind of way when it comes to having a very comprehensive strategy for doing that. So you don't rely on any one part of the system being the thing that is going to protect you in the event of a data breach, right? Yeah. The second piece is um, if you don't have to make copies of the data, that's always a good thing. It's almost like the, the first thing you do is you find yourself in a hole and stop digging. And so if you have you know, one copy of data and now you have five copies of data, it's five things that you have to secure. So one of the unique things that we focus on is how can we have multiple analytic experiences over the same data set? So you don't have to copy a data set just because you know I'm going to access it using using SQL or access it using machine learning. It'll be it's important to be able to do that on the same data set. So fewer copies, fewer things to administer. Similarly, the last piece of this is to say, imagine if you had a data set that was actually created on premise and then it showed up in a public cloud. So when you replicate the data, we want you to replicate the data security policies. So that if a user had access to th only three columns when it was on premise, they still only have access to those same three columns when it's in the public cloud. So centralizing policy management so that the idea is, you know, we want to give people very scalable ways that they can manage data security so that, not, so that in their busy lives, they don't have to think about repeating the same authorization tasks that they have multiple times over. So they can do it once correctly and then it just happens to be enforced everywhere through a platform like Clutter. I think that's the vision that we have. Again, it goes back to that data fabric and the consistent data management experience. But these are the sort of three foundational things that I've seen work really well in our customer base. That's fantastic. You know, um, I guess talk, moving on from there, talking about your customer base and, you know, the position you have, being able to see companies and how they're using data globally. I'm really interested to know, I guess, from your perspective, seeing things from that global level, um, you know, what sort of 
trends do you think you're seeing and what are things emerging maybe maybe in the US or elsewhere that you think leaders in Australia should be paying attention to that they're yeah. probably perhaps not aware of yet? And I'll also pick up on a trend that I think that's fairly advanced in the APAC that I think leaders in the US should be. Right? Both ways, right. I think that there's some learning to be, yeah, to be yeah. had there, right? So, so I think the first one is, uh, you know, data mesh is something that you will increasingly start to hear about as, as a way to think about, you know, rolling out data use cases. It all comes down to time to value, right? Being able to, to actually, you know, for every business, Globally, right? The if you could do something in three months last year, now you want to do it in three weeks this year, right? So it's that it's that need for speed or to be able to accelerate how quickly you can you can take a data use case from a concept to production that directly translates to to business outcomes, right? So I think this is where uh, decentralizing broadly is is a way to to make this process go faster. We have seen this applied to general software delivery. And I think that data is just the next frontier for, for agile development and agile methodology to be applied. This is novel because traditionally, you know, data has sort of been like this, something that, that, that is a purvey of IT and it, it moves slower than some of these other parts of the enterprise. And now increasingly people want to move fast with data, right? So I think that's a trend that um, in Australia also, you know, this comes up in customer conversations. I expect that, you know, we'll see more of this in the, in the coming years. So this, this whole concept of decentralized rapid innovation around data inside a company, right? I think that can be very valuable for a, for a company uh, when they think about innovating with data. I think in the other direction, um, I think data sovereignty is a topic that I see in Australia and in, in the rest of APAC in general. There are just a lot of, uh, you know, I think that regulations have been passed which have made companies be aware of how to deal with concepts like the end consumers consent management to how they want their data to be used. I think this is an area where uh, the APAC, I think actually is, is ahead of where the US is today, right? And so I think that, uh, you know, as individuals, we all care about how our data is going to be used, right? And I think this, this is a trend that uh, complying with these regulations helps us build systems that are that are more responsive to what the actual end customer, consumer wants, which I think that's a valuable part of us being part of this ecosystem. Yeah, that's fantastic. I appreciate that. Both of those, that's awesome. Um, I guess, you know, anything else you'd like to talk about, I'd be glad. I've come to the end of my questions. Yeah, and the other one I had really was, you know, what else has been in your mind lately? I guess, are there things you've been reading or thinking about or, yeah. you know, I guess, pondering? You know, I'm just keen to know from you what what um yeah what what else is on your mind and that you'd love to talk about. I, I think you know uh, one that comes to mind is Chat GPT. Yes. I mean, unless unless you've been living under a rock, right? It's uh, just amazing <laughs> how quickly Chat GPT is part of our, our our conversation, our consciousness now, right? So I think that uh, I ponder what is the role of something like chat GPT when it comes to data privacy and issues like that. And then the other side of that is, uh, I think that this way of conversational interaction with the computer, I think this is new, right? This this feels very, uh, very natural, right? You ask questions, you can say, no, 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 I didn't mean this. You can, you can correct context that, that you said a few minutes ago and it's able to follow along and say, yeah, you're really talking about Talking about this concept that you that you mentioned a few seconds ago, so I think conversational analytics is something that I think that's going to be very compelling. Right for us in the data world, right? We, you know, Cloudera, our tagline used to be, you know, ask bigger questions, and I think that ChatGPT is helping is, is is allowing people to ask anything they want in a very conversational way, and I expect that they will want the same from from their enterprise data. There's no reason why it should be clunky to analyze enterprise data. So I've been you know, spending a fair amount of time thinking about what do technologies like large language models and chat GPT mean for, for, for enterprise analytics for data. Mm. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. You think um, in future we'll see that as part of that is offering something? I, I, would, I would love to say that, yes. You know, I think that, uh, you know, this is just, once an interaction pattern becomes exposed, I think we learn from it and we say, okay, this makes a lot of sense. It's very natural. But then, you know, putting the, 
the guardrails around the technology so that you know the the applications we're talking about here like education and healthcare and so on precision matters right and so i think <laughs> it's like how, <laughs> how do you get precision as well as conversational it's something that has not been cracked but i think that this is definitely that's what's nice and exciting for me about the data space is that you know 6 months ago we wouldn't have had this conversation around chat gpt right so it's like ways you analyze your data there's always when you think that you know you you know all the different ways to do it 6 months later something new comes along it's another way to look at data in a completely different way and i think that's mm. this is just the next iteration i think of questions that people want to pose against the data yeah that's brilliant no i appreciate that a lot that's wonderful you've been awesome to speak to um that's been very insightful